Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I think this is on. I'm not sure. It sounds like it's coming. There it is. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So, I must say, standing here, I feel completely incapable of actually um, bringing the message that I feel must be brought. Uh, and also, the other dilemma that I'm facing is a lot of, I feel in my heart, is maybe, is maybe for me, you know, that I, things that I need to work on and things that I need to address in my life. So I have to discern very carefully between what is Father's word for me and what is his word for us this morning. And so I'm trusting him that he will speak to us this morning. And uh, so I've got a very simple and straightforward one, one slide presentation. So we'll see how this goes and where it goes. May Father lead us. But this is an, a very important uh, teaching this morning, actually, and it's all about how we draw near to our Father in heaven. And what is our heart condition in that process? And what has He done to make that open for us? And it's a, it's a subject that I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with, actually. And I've heard a, a sermon or a teaching um, or studied this yourself a lot. This week's uh, discussion is specifically around the whole sacrificial system in the tabernacle and in the temple. But there's a history where this is coming from. And it's, we see this from, from the beginning that People draw near to our Heavenly Father and they have different reasons and different ways of doing that. But all of that seems to be ordained and, and uh, approved by God. But there are exceptions, obviously, to this that we'll quickly touch on. But what I'm saying, essentially, is that from the beginning, there has been a pattern that Father has established. So we may think of the Mosaic Law when, when Moses went and started writing down the words of our Father, the commands for His people. But this word started much, much further back. Because remember, the word is eternal. It emanates from the Father's heart. So these things are His words for us, and it's been given from the beginning. Remember that Father walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, and He spoke to them. So we know, for example... Their children, Cain and Abel, they were somehow informed about sacrifices because Cain and Abel brought sacrifices before Father. And Abel's sacrifice, we know, was accepted. And there are various opinions and reasons given of why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and, and Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. All of them in some way, touches on, it seems to be, the heart condition. How was the sacrifice brought before Father? With what heart was it given? It seems like with, with Abel that he gave his best, the best of what he had, the firstborn, the best. You know, and, and that speaks of, in, in Hebrews, actually, it says, in Hebrews 4, 11, sorry, 11 verse 4, I think it says that, that Abel brought a sacrifice by faith. And so, what does he put his faith in? Remember that if you are a farmer and you've got livestock or grain, anything that is produced that's not in your control, you are not the one that makes that live. You are, in a way, trusting that these things will reproduce and grow and multiply. And so when, when, when Abel comes and brings his sacrifice of the firstborn, He's in the position where he's saying, Father, I trust you that there will be more. I give this to you as a thank offering to you, to thank you for your provision. But it seems like Cain maybe brought a sacrifice that was inferior. And again, as I say, there's many ways of looking at that and there's various opinions about why it is inferior. But the bottom line is that God rejects his offering and what's telling, I think, is his response. 
you know, he, he gets angry. He goes after his brother and kills him. And we know the story well. But it shows, you know, if we think about, you know, later on, I think what I'd like to do is touch on a little bit about the foundations of our faith in terms of how we draw near to Father and, and the commands that He's given to us and the ones that Yeshua highlights in terms of the greatest two commands, you know, loving God with everything you've got and loving your neighbor. And it seems here yeah, already that, that Cain presents this, this flaw, you know, where is his love for God and how does it manifest? His love for his neighbor results actually in the murder of his brother. So he did not have love for his neighbor in that sense. So that's already going far back. You know, we see with Noah, he brought sacrifices as a thank after the flood. We see Abraham, we see Jacob, we see Job. Job intercedes for his children. You know, they are, it's, they, it seems from Scripture that they are adult children already. And he's concerned about their, their walking before the Father. So he continually uh, brings sacrifices to try and intercede on their behalf. To say, Father, please help my children. Please forgive them. Have mercy on them. And we know the story with Job. But we see, the, see a pattern of sacrifice brought before Father from the very beginning, way before the Mosaic law, before it was written down for us in the Torah. But all of this is in the framework of bringing a, a gift or an offering in the presence of God. Now, whatever is brought before Him, if you think the, the smoke rises, the, the heart is seen, Father looks upon this and He knows the hearts and the thoughts and the motives. He tests what is brought to him, and why is it brought to him? And he looks upon this, and I think this, uh, in a way, with Cain and Abel for me, what's really, really something that just struck me a little bit is they, are, they must be somehow aware of the reality of this Creator God. And therefore they bring this offering before Him. But this reality of this Creator God that is the author of reality... In a way, it seems like Cain forgets the reality of how important it is to bring your best. He somehow has another reality, his own reality, the way he wants to do it, with his heart, his intentions. But I don't want to dwell too much on Cain and Abel, because in a way, I think, to be honest, I think in a way we have parts of that in us as well. You know, we are not so simple. We are quite complex beings, quite intricately made, beautifully made, fearfully and wonderfully made, actually. And, and in us, we have a continual struggle, I believe, to choose. Do we bring our best? Or do we choose something else? To bring to Father, almost second best, you know, like as an afterthought, just quickly remembering, oh yes, this weekend, it's Sabbath again, wow, this week has just flown by, and in the week, maybe you were far away, you withdrew a little bit, and you were busy with your own things, and then you remember again, oh, it's Sabbath, oh, wait, there's a festival coming up, and you, but you got so busy with life, and it's not an accusation, I mean, it's, it's a reality of something that we all battle with, but I'm pointing out that there's this constant tugging within us all. So there's a Cain and Abel in a way in us all. And so I want to bring it closer towards this week's portion that we, we see in, in Exodus 27 to Exodus 30. And there's a lot of information that Father gives us in terms of the patterns, symbolic patterns in all these things that's made for the tabernacle the garments for the priests and how they are to dedicate themselves before Father. What are the processes for that? What is needed to, to come before Him? But one of them is really something that stands out to me this week, is the continual burnt offering before Father. And continual stands out. It's not something that happens now and again. It's not when you want it's not what's comfortable. It's not the way also that you want. It's all according to the pattern and the design that Father ordained. 
And it's continual. And I think, to be honest, if you think about the practical implications of all these sacrifices and all these rituals that Father gives to His people, they have to wake up every morning and start again. If they feel like it or not. If it's raining, if it's hailing, if it's snowing, if someone dies. You know, look at Aaron and his two sons later on with Nadav in a view. How they are bringing a, a strange fire before Father. They are consumed, they die, and then Aaron has to continue. So there's this, this thing of setting ourselves aside and continually choosing to walk disciplined before Father. So, but this, this continual offering, there's something interesting in there that really jumped out at me. And it is the fact that there are two lambs, one in the morning and one in the twilight of the day that is brought. And every morning, the lamb is slaughtered, put onto the altar, and then throughout the day, as everyone brings in their offerings, their sacrifices, their thank offerings, their guilt offerings, their peace offerings, their meal, all those things are brought and it's put on top of this morning lamb. It starts the day. It lays the foundation for everything that's, that, that's put on top. And then the fire must burn continually. And then at the end of the day, when it starts getting close to becoming dark, there's a, there's a second lamb that's put on top of this, and it sandwiches essentially everything in between. It covers, in a way, everything in between. And obviously we can draw a lot of you know, connections with, what does this lamb represent? These two lambs, what does it represent? Some say it could be the two comings of Messiah. Some say um, it could represent... Um, well, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things. That, let me not get distracted on those. The point for me is that John, the immerser, John the Baptist, when he sees Yeshua, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. So in a way, I think there's a strong connection that we can see that this speaks to Yeshua in a way. And in what way? Well, there are probably multiple ways. But the one that really is important, I think, to remember and to take note of is that Yeshua is the foundation, is the beginning and the end. And in Him, He holds all together. He covers all. He atones all. That for me is beautiful. But this lays the foundation for the rest of all the services that happen in the tabernacle and in the temple. Nothing else happens without the continual burnt offering being there the whole time. Remember, Yeshua is before the Father interceding for us continually. And so this continual burnt offering is the framework on which everything in the temple hangs. It's the framework on which sacrifice and offering hangs. And we, when we hear the words where everything hangs on this, on these two lambs essentially, what else does Yeshua say hangs on two things? We know when the Pharisees approach Yeshua, they say to him, so if you think you're so clever, tell us, what is the greatest command then? And then Yeshua very wisely says, well, actually, and he quotes from Leviticus and he quotes from Deuteronomy and he says, firstly, the Shema, to love the Lord your God with everything you've got. He is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy to be praised. And then secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. So on these two commands, all the law and the prophet hangs. So it's very similar in a way, you know. We see the, the, the temple service, all these offerings and sacrifices, they hang on this continual burnt offering, these two lambs. These commands that Yeshua speaks of, it all hangs on these two, to love, to love. You know, so everything is actually about loving. And we know this. We say this, we've heard this, we intellectually we know this. And then, you know, for me also the, the interesting thing is, even though we know these things often, and this is, I think, part of the battle. And this is where I kind of need to discern between what is Father saying to me personally in my preparation and in my personal battles and walk before Father. What is He saying to me and what is He saying to us as a church, as a congregation, not only as Restoration Fellowship, but across this earth. There's a body of believers. And I think the world, in a way, 
looks at the church and criticizes and say, says, well, you don't look much different, actually. You say all these things. You know all those things. You speak the words. But divorce rates are exactly the same between you and the rest of the world. Hatred is the same. Murder, theft, it's the same. So we say these things, but I think we really, really stood still for a moment and reflected. I mean, it's easy to say they, but we need to look at ourselves and say, Father, what am I doing? Is my sacrifice before you an honest, loving sacrifice? And we'll speak about what that sacrifice means today for us practically. But the question maybe arises firstly is, why? Why are these sacrifices? I mean, why does God require the people to bring these animals and these grain offerings, these wine offerings? Why does He need these things? Actually, does He even need these things? I know our answer would be, of course He does not need these things. I mean, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the creator of all things. By his word, everything was made. Does he need anything? Of course not. Can we give him anything that he lacks? Of course not. And we know this. <laughs> but there is something, I believe, that he desires. But what is that? What does he desire from us? And I believe we must also consider with anything when it comes to sacrifices, if it doesn't cost us anything. I mean, I remember now quickly King David in Second Samuel. He says, I will not bring an offering that does not cost me anything. And I know we'll later on speak a little bit about what, what David says about you know, what Father actually desires in terms of our, our, our offerings and our sacrifices before Him. And there are m multiple things said about that, but, you know, firstly, sacrifice, if it does not come at a great cost, I think we fall short. But this sacrifice, this cost, I mean, think about this quickly for a moment. I don't want to get derailed, but think about this reality. I mean, we think today, if we sacrifice something, then maybe we think of maybe some financial sacrifice, or maybe a little bit of our time, or our gifts in a way. Perhaps we think of those things. But compare this quickly to Israel's reality. What do they bring before Father? They continually are bringing the best of their flocks, the best of their harvests, the first fruits, the firstborn, while all the nations around them are gathering and collecting and protecting all these things that are valuable, Israel is actually bringing this before Father, letting it go up in smoke. And yet, Israel, when they are walking in obedience and humility before Father, they are abundantly blessed beyond all the nations of this earth. Even when they are giving all these things that are precious to them, actually, but they are giving this to Father and yet, and then in, in direct distinction from the rest of the world who wants to hold these things close to themselves, they are giving this. And it speaks of a trust. It speaks of a faith in Father. He will provide. He will give. He will make the next harvest come. He will make after the firstborn, there will be a secondborn and a thirdborn and a fourthborn. They trust that. They believe that. Well, we hope. And we know the story of Israel, how they... And we are the same. We are Israel, remember? We are grafted in. So when we say them, we are speaking of us also. So, you know, they continually draw close and then they get distracted and they withdraw. And then they draw close again. And every time they draw close, it goes well with them. And when they draw away, when they get distracted, Father's blessing, His presence almost walks away. He withdraws. But you know, if we think of all these things of sacrifices and, and offerings, in all these things, I believe that Father is trying to teach us hope and patience and a wait on Him. Wait for the next harvest. Trust Him that we, there will be harvest. I mean, I was speaking actually a little bit earlier about the cost. You know, what does it cost them? Well, yes, it costs them their firstborn, their best. But then, not only that, they have to have the 
Shemitah year, every seventh year, let the ground rest. So they have to trust Him that there will be enough. Every 50th year, the Jubilee, they have to let the captives go. They have to, set the, they have to give the land back. They have to trust Him. They're not, they, they, they're not meant to act like the rest of the world. They have to trust in God the whole time. And so I honestly believe that true sacrifice, sorry, true worship, cannot be without sacrifice. But we need to understand what sacrifice means. I don't think we really truly have grasped it yet. Maybe some have gotten close. I mean, I've seen, I've seen and looked at people, and sometimes I think to myself, wow, wow. If I can have a, just 1%, of that person's heart to love people, to lay their own will down. If I can just have 1% of that, then I'll be a better person. I've looked at some people, and, I, and we know the heroes of the faith. We know the, the stories of the martyrs and the, the people that have given everything to, to go and proclaim the gospel, for example. You know? And so their sacrifice, yes. But true worship, I think, cannot be without true sacrifice. And we see that, we know it's proven in Yeshua. His act of sacrifice is the ultimate form of worship, actually. It's the ultimate form of obedience. He says, I, I will do your will, Father. I lay my life down to do your will. You know, I, I did touch on a little bit earlier about the fact that sacrifice is all about drawing near to our Father. Let's quickly touch on, just quickly, proving what I'm saying the word offering, sorry, that we see in, in English, offering, the Hebrew for that is korban. And its root word is karav, which means to draw near. So the basis, in other words, the root of an offering is actually the intention, the heart, is to draw near. Drawing near to our Creator, drawing near to our Father, drawing, one to our, draw, drawing near to our Provider. You know, we can think of our intentions, we can speak of our motives, and we, we can reflect on these things a lot. But I think part of this needs to be important as well is the fact of considering what is Father's desire, ultimately. As I said earlier, you know, and we all know this, is Father does not need our sacrifices. He does not need the blood of goats and bulls and rams. He does not need our first fruits. So what is his desire? And I think maybe this is where I want to spend a little bit of time on. Now think about this as a love relationship. If you've got two people that love one another, they are lovers. There should be a desire in both parties to want to draw near, to want to be close, to know the heart of the other one, and to submit and to do the, the best interests for the other one. And so, in a way, what is God's desire? If we think of Him, if He says He's the lover of our souls, if we say that, how do we see His desire? I think it's clear throughout the Word, throughout the Scriptures, that He is willing to give everything. And He has given everything to be with us, to draw close to us. Do we deserve it? We all know that, it's, that the answer there is, no, we don't deserve it. But he wants to draw close to us. But what does he get out of it? Because he doesn't need anything. And I've really tried to think, you know, what, what does God get out of this? What does he need that we can give him? Nothing. So why? And you know, the only thing I could think of was just a simple picture that came to mind. And I actually don't know really how to convey it, but it's very simple actually. It, it's simply the idea of, of a plant. You know, a plant is meant to, to grow leaves and develop and ev eventually flower and bear fruit. And for the plant to do that, he needs a couple of things. He needs ground to stand in. He needs some water. The plant needs light. 
And so what does a normal, natural, healthy plant do? Well, the leaves reach out to the light. It grows towards the light. And when the plant does that, it goes well with the plant. The plant is nourished by the soil, watered, and then the sun causes the plant to create and generate food, and the plant can grow and be healthy. And so, in a way, I would say, you know, we are much like this plant. In ourselves, we cannot grow. We are dead without the light of Father. We are dead without the ground, the resources, the nutrients that He provides. We are dead without His living water. So we are much like this plant. We are like trees. We have heard this and said this a couple of times. Men are like trees. Mankind is like trees or are like trees. And our Heavenly Father is the light of the world. Yeshua is the light of the world. So when, when He shines upon us and we have a natural and healthy reaction, we should be turning to Him. And when He looks upon us and we are growing and we are multiplying leaves and branches and producing fruit, I'm sure He smiles upon that. It brings Him joy. So he actually, his desire is our wellness. His desire is for, for it to go well with us. Not necessarily materialistically or circumstantially always, but in our innermost being. He wants us to be well, to have shalom. And that is his desire, or at least part of it, definitely. It brings him joy, I believe, when we draw close to him and want to draw close to him. Again, coming back to the idea of a lover. You know, you want the other person to want you. You want them to love you. You want them to desire and be close to you and, and know your heart, know your thoughts, and care about it. And it's the same with Him. He wants to be close to us, and He wants us to desire Him. He wants us to desire to know His heart and and his intentions, and his thoughts. He wants us to yearn for him. Why, though, again, maybe, to reiterate? Because it's good for us. It will be well with us when we do that, like the plant. When the plant reaches out to the light, it will be well with the plant. When the plant soaks up the water, it will be well with the plant. When the plant, plant stands in, in fertile soil and pushes roots deep in, it will be well with the plant. And so it will be well with us when we dig into our Father, when we take up His nutrients that He gives to us, when we drink of His living water, when we reach out to His light, it will be well with us. And it pleases Him when that happens. So what is our response? If that is His desire, is that our desire? And I think in a way, as I said earlier with Cain and Abel, I believe, in a way, we have both those in ourselves. You know, we know Paul says this so well in, in Romans 7. There's this inner battle. You know, there's the things that you want to do well. There's the things that you know are right to do. But then this inward struggle, you know, the distractions of the world, your own desires, your own motivations. And so we've got this battle continually. And so I'm thinking, you know, what is our response? You know, there's no temple at the moment that stands. We don't bring the sacrifices of bulls and goats. Yeshua is the ultimate sacrifice. He covers these things. He's our atonement before Father. We can bring nothing further than that and beyond that. But is there something that we can bring? And I know you've probably heard this as well. But, you know, it is our thank it is saying to Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. It is a heart that comes before Father to say, Father, I desire to know your way. I desire to know your heart. Teach it to me. I am foolish. I, am, I fall short. But I acknowledge that your ways are beautiful. I acknowledge that your heart is is a treasure, and I, I want to reach out to you, but I come short. So please, Father, have mercy on me. Reach out your hands to me and pick me up. 
that could be part of our response as well. That is worship. Because it costs us something. I mean, what does it cost us? It costs us our pride. We have to lay down our pride. Because we acknowledge, when we say these things to Him, we acknowledge that we come short. We cannot be proud. I mean, one of the awesome statements that I heard a while back was, you know, at the end of the day, when we have our various opinions and thoughts and interpretations of Scripture, you know, various denominations, and we end up in the kingdom through His grace, and we, we are before His feet, I don't think there will be much words. There won't be much you know, boasting of how right you were, or how well you understood Scripture, or how well you kept the, the commands. There won't be much conversation. I think your mouth will be shut. Your face will be flat on the ground. You'll be flat down on the ground, and there will be no height difference between you and the next person. You won't be able to look down on your neighbor. All of your noses will be flat on the ground with mine before Father. And so our response can only be a thank offering before Him. Laying down our will before Him. Acknowledging that we need Him. You know, I think the, the battle that I'm facing and that I think we all face is we realize this sometimes. We have glimpses of, of, of this reality. But we see in a, in a glass dimly. You know, we, we only get a glance, a glimpse of this. You know? I mean, because think about this. I mean, we are speaking of an almighty, almighty creator. Worthy to be praised. His name is, is above all names. We do not even grasp His majesty. We do not understand the depths of His love and His compassion. We do not. We can say and think, maybe that we've got an idea, and that will fall far short. And then we say this, and we acknowledge this. But I'm just asking for myself, if I know this, and if I really believe this, shouldn't it reflect in my life? Shouldn't I somehow show that in my walk, in my behavior, in my words? And there are glimpses of that sometimes through God's grace and mercy that He changes us and He sanctifies us. Yes. But I'm... I don't know. There's this hope in me. There's this yearning in me for more, for reaching out to our Father to say, Father, please have mercy on us. This world is in darkness. This world is controlled by evil intentions. Men controlled by evil spirits, forces in the air that wants to bring destruction and death. And we are not necessarily going to change that. We are not going to take that away. So what is our role? than in these things? How do we bring the kingdom where we put our, foot, our, our footsteps? You know, and I think James touched on this a little bit in a way. The only response I think we can have that I can think of now, there may, may be others as well, but one of them, I think, at least, to, is to show kindness. To be the opposite of the world. To be the opposite of their ways of thinking, and sometimes even our ways of thinking. You know, again, let us be careful to say theirs and us. We're not much better. Sometimes we are actually worse. Because if we say that we care, and we then act differently, we are worse than the ones that don't really care, and they don't even say that they care. We said that we care, and then we don't show it. That's worse. You know, so, again... I think, you know, as I said, a lot of in my praying and in preparation, it was so, so challenging, you know, where I realize, you know, a lot of what Father's saying is for me, that I need to work on and, and address, and I don't know how. I honestly, I have no idea how. I don't know how to change. I don't know how to be better. All I can say is, Father, help. 
And I know when I say that, you know what it feels like. Because you feel the same, I'm trusting. That, that you want to be better, you want to reach for greater things, to draw near to Him, honestly, intimately, closely, with real honest motives, to bring your best, to give your best, to not expect a reward, to not expect someone to say to you, oh, well done, you're such a great Christian, you're such a great Hebrew Roots follower, whatever. No, to, to really honestly want to, to do good, to do well. And I know I'm preaching to the converted. I mean, I'm saying these things and you know these things. But I wanted to remind myself perhaps and to remind us that He is worthy to be praised. And I think take a moment to realize that, you know, not now necessarily, but please make time to just become quiet before Him. And to acknowledge just who He is. And then to ask the question, Father, what do you want from me? And then help me. Strengthen my hands. Strengthen my mouth, my thoughts, my feet. To do what you want to do in this world. You know, we all fall short. You know, we know that. We fall short. But I think also that God, God's desire is for us to realize this and to acknowledge it. His desire is for us to come before Him humbly. He's waiting for us to do that. To bow our knee before Him. To say, Father, I do love You. And even that love falls short. But then take my small sacrifice of this little dust particle that's walking around on this earth for a very short time. But take this, and if it's your will, you know, use it for good. May I do good in this world. May my life be a, a blessing to others and to my wife and to my children. May we be a blessing to, to our neighbors. You know, may we be a blessing to this world when the world needs it. They don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But let us be kind. Let us bring our best sacrifice before Him. Let us give us, or give Him our best, ultimately. Let's leave it there. Our Heavenly Father, you know my heart's wrestling this week. And even standing here, knowing that my words fall short of what you actually want to really say. So Father, I bring whatever was said or thought this morning. Let us bring that to you, Father. We bring it to you and say, Father, draw near to us. Help us to draw near to you. Father, thank you for your patience and your kindness and your grace towards us. Yeshua, thank you that you have made the way, that you are the two bookends, that you are the beginning and the end. You are the one that covers all and contains all and hold all things in your hand and, hold, and you hold all together. And your will is that everything will be restored to favor before our Heavenly Father because of what you've done, Yeshua. We acknowledge that you are worthy to be praised. And we admit that we say things so easily. And we maybe sometimes put up an act so easily. But Father, do not leave us where we are. Father, pick us up and, and heal us and restore us and cleanse us with your living water. Father, flow through our hearts. Renew our thinking. Father, strengthen us. And uh, Father, I want to praise you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness, Father. Father, bless this community and these people. 
Father, may your shalom rest on them. Father, fill them with wisdom and discernment and understanding. Open their ears and their hearts. And I ask the same humbly for myself. Father, thank you that when we ask these things from you, that you do not harden your heart. Father, your timing is good and your ways are good and precious. And we put our trust in you. And so however long it takes, Father, you have started a work in us and you will complete it. And your name will be glorified. And all our mouths together will worship you. In spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you that you care for us. And help us to care for others. Place your love in our hearts. That we can be a blessing in this world that desperately needs it. May your name be glorified, Father. We ask this in humility, only because of what Yeshua has done. May your will be done on this earth. And may your kingdom come quickly, Father. Amen.